welcome to SB Connect, where we connect to and educate for the world of work. Today, we're live at the San Bernardino County International Airport in collaboration with Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Today, we have an incredible, an incredible session planned for you. Aerial Delivered Firefighter Jason Ramos is with us today. And the topic that he's going to be presenting on today is called Fire Safety from the Perspective of an Aerial Delivered Firefighter. So we're going to talk about some <clears throat> interesting stuff today. And what's what kind of makes my story very nice to you guys is I, I come from Riverside County, so right next door to where you guys live. And I started off at a very young age at 17. And you know, I didn't know that I wanted to be a firefighter, but it was something that uh, had interest to me. And that's where I started, Riverside County, uh, back in 1989. And as I went through my years of training and training and training, I, I heard of these, these aerial delivered firefighters called smoke jumpers. And that to me just, again, was very, very um, interesting. I didn't understand what that was, right? I didn't, um, I kind of knew they, they came by planes and aircraft by parachute, which there's not many of them. So since 1939 to date, there's still less than 6,000 smoke jumpers that have completed the course to become a United States smoke jumper. So when I'm in the fire service, it's kind of like the military, it's a paramilitary, you have different um, tools in the fire service, you have fire engines that you guys have seen near your, your counties and schools. You've seen, um, right, we live in Southern California. So you have all the wildfires that you see you see all the planes, helicopters, so there's different parts of the fire service. And the aerial delivered part is kind of like the smoke is what we call the smoke tempers, kind of like the Air Force. So as I got, um, how would you say, uh, involved in, in seeing and experienced this, I remember being in junior high watching a documentary. This is way before, right? I started the fire service, uh, smoke jumpers. And it was something, again, that I wanted to be part of. And never knew right i was scared of heights i still to this day i don't i don't love heights but when you, when you go to work and the amount of training that you do um, you perform at a high level so that's where i started right again right here in Riverside county and i became one of the, the very few less than six thousand that it became a smoke jumper and again our main goal is to travel to a forest fire anywhere in the united states mostly in the pacific northwest uh, or even california and put the fires out before they get big. Most of those fires are gonna be started by lightning. So here in Southern California, uh, during the summer, sometimes you guys will hear the, the thunder and the rain. Uh, sometimes those clouds do start forest fires and that's when smoke jumpers and all these other uh, entities, uh, tools from the fire service will respond to help extinguish these, these fires. So again, right where you guys live is where I started. So that kind of puts a connection uh, and it's, it's very interesting and, and proud to be back where I started here in, in Riverside County, right next door to San Bernardino. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about um, some of the, the functions and tools that we use as aero delivered firefighters. And we're gonna break it down very simple for you. So we've all been, most of you've been on a camping trip with your parents, right? A campfire. So what we do when we're on a forest fire is we, we cut fire line. And what we're doing is we're taking the food away from the fire. Fire needs fuel, heat, and oxygen. We call the fire triangle. And if the fire doesn't have anything to eat, right, it, it can't live. If it does have any oxygen, it can't live. If we make it cold, it can't live. So fire's a chemical reaction, but it's just like, um, I like to call it a living thing because just like us, we need food. We need to be warm. We need oxygen to breathe, right? So when we come on a, a forest fire, we're gonna have tools. One of the tools is called a Pulaski. That was designed back in the 1910s after the 1910s fire from Edward Pulaski. And it's basically a part ax and part a grubbing hoe to dig up the dirt and cut trees and brush. So what we do is we make a small fire line around the fire and that helps contain and then we can go into an extinguishment to the fire. And what makes smoke jumpers interesting is we don't have a, a fire engine. We don't have fire hose most of the time. We call 
what we call is dry firefighting. So we're only using our hand tools. We use dirt to smother the fire, to cool it off. And then again, we take the food away. So now fire doesn't have anything to eat, it slowly dies down. Um, and what's really interesting about smoke jumpers, a lot of times you won't even know that we're in your area. We get, remember we jump out of a plane with a parachute, we'll insert hike to the fire. We use our, that's our means of travel, this is our legs. Um, sometimes it could be a 10 minute hike. Sometimes it could be an hour or maybe even longer to get to the fire uh, before we even go to work. So those are some of the tools that we use. And we also can use helicopters, planes, which you see here in Southern California, we get to call them. Uh, we have, all have radios and we get to use them as our resources. So it's a team effort. It's not just us, we use different agencies. We work with different departments, which we call mutual aid. So that's kind of the tools we have. A, think of the plane as a shopping cart. So when you go to your um, shopping with your parents, right? You put all the food in the cart. So think of the plane has all these items for us. And when we jump out, we get to grab those items and use them on a fire. So those are some of the, the common uh, tools that we use in firefighting. If we're near a fire engine, we're obviously going to be, uh, it's a good day for us because now we have water, we have fire hose. Um, so there's just different tools that we get to use depending on what type of fire mission that we're headed to. So the next topic we're going to talk about is, is, is a lot of, there's a lot of technology now. So from when I started in 1989 to date, a lot of things have changed. Some of the gear we still wear is the same. Uh, one interesting topic uh, as a smoke jumper, we make our own gear. So we also learn how to sew. So our packs, our jumpsuits, uh, any specialized gear that we might need in the field, you get to go. We have a big uh, sewing loft, a bunch of sewing machines, and you get taught how to sew. So I know some of the guys are laughing, right? You guys, you guys sew, so we do learn how to uh, make our own gear. And everyone has their own kind of skills. Some folks are very good at um, design, what we call research and design R&D. And some folks are very good at other technology, whether it be GPSs or radio communications, drones, uh, helicopter operations. So every firefighter kind of through their career will pick their skill sets and will keep educating through their, their whole career. So even though I'm getting close with my time of being in the fire service for so many years, every day I'm still, every week I'm still training through this whole process. So we never stop training as a fire truck. That's in every county, every state in the United States and even other uh, countries. Every morning they're gonna wake up, they're doing uh, their cleanup, they're cleaning the bathrooms, making breakfast. Once that's done, they're gonna do their equipment engine checkouts, whether it be a plane or a fire engine. Uh, they're gonna go through their uh, normal chores of the day and then we're gonna go into training. So it's a never, uh, ending a process to make sure that we're the best we can be when things go really bad. That's what someone calls 911 or we're headed to an emergency. So we're going to break off into some of the uh, drones. Uh, and the drone center here, uh, the UES center here is very interesting because as a, uh, before he's been a teenager, I got to come here when this is the old Air Force, uh, North Air Force base. And it's and very interesting and proud to be back here as an advisor for the drone centers so with all my experience for drones um, or radio controlled aircraft i've been flying radio controlled aircraft uh, since around 2005 so from a hobby to now advising for the air center of all the drones being used for fire departments uh, the training that we provide here at the air center and also on fire emergencies so uh, it, it's a great field to learn. Flight is an amazing thing, right? I mean, how many of you uh, guys, when a plane goes over, right, we're all kind of looking up and seeing, you know, what kind of plane that is, what they're doing. So it's something we've always, uh, especially in, in California, right, you're always seeing helicopters and planes, and especially on fire. So it's, it's very nice to take some of my experience and be able to offer it back into the community of the training and the amount of expertise that is coming out of the drone center here in San Bernardino. The drones are, again, the, the technology is growing so fast. 
Um, it hasn't been that long since I received my first drone. It's only been about seven, eight years, and the amount of technology is just, uh, it, it truly is amazing. We have a, a kind of a joke, right? If I don't look on YouTube or do some research in a week, I get kind of behind because the technology goes so fast in drones. For my first drone with no sensors, meaning that I could fly into something and it wouldn't alarm me to now, uh, the drone will let me to fly into anything uh, most of the time. So a lot of technology and safety uh, things have been added to these drones to help firefighters, law enforcement, military, even hobbyists uh, to go out and have a, a great flight with their with their family or drone racing. Right? There's all these cool things you can do with drones and radio controlled aircraft. So the UES Center here is definitely at the tip of the spear um, for the drone technology in Southern California. Drones are used in, in many different ways, uh, especially in the, in the United States and Southern California. So anywhere from law enforcement to fighting fire, the drones just have such a great capability. Um, if you ever noticed a fire, a wildland fire here in Southern California, you see all the planes and you'll see, you'll notice a, a small plane that'll circle that fire um, pretty much all day long. So drones can be the same kind of thing. So when it's uh, a small mission, a small fire, search and rescue, drones can do the same thing, which we call situational awareness, um, acronym we call it SA. So these drones are able to tell us, you know, if we're looking for someone, if there's a trail right over the hill that we couldn't see, right, it might take us an hour or two hours to hike up a mountain, 45 minutes, where we can launch a drone very quickly to see if those are the folks we're looking for, or if we're trying to remember, as we spoke of making fire line, right, taking the food away from the fire. So there's many things that we can use the drones for. And to date, um, I do a lot of search and rescue in Washington State, that's where I'm from now. And uh, the drones are so helpful, not only from emergencies, but for education. So this drone center here is, again, at the tip of the spear for uh, Southern California right now to show the capabilities, uh, what drones can do. And again, you don't have to you know, be a first responder like me. You don't have to be a smoke jumper, but just the hobby itself, it's a great activity with your parents, uh, your friends, anywhere from drone racing, uh, photography. Uh, we have drones now with thermal cameras that it, it opens up a whole different world of flight. And now you can actually, with some training, you can actually come home after school and on the weekend and enjoy flight. You can watch wildlife, you can, again, then you can go into a field as well, whether it be uh, as a first responder, as a firefighter, a smoke jumper, law enforcement, military, or even start your own business. So drones are pretty fun. Flight is a, a very interesting thing. Again, how many of you folks, again, when you hear a plane over, usually people are looking up to see what that is. So drones is an awesome thing. I love it to death and I'm glad to be at the drone center here helping especially back to basically where I grew up. So I hope that makes you guys think a little bit. I hope you guys have some great questions for me. Uh, ask me anything. I'm here to, again, for you guys. And even after the event here, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, you can read my book. I'm the author of Smoke Jumper. Um, you can find some videos on me. I've done a TEDx in the past. So don't ever hesitate. If you uh, drop me an email or even call me, I will answer the phone and, and get back to you. Educators, educators and students, and students uh, you have, have an opportunity now to submit your questions in the chat box for Mr. Ramos. Uh, we already have some questions. First question is, what is the biggest fire you have ever fought? Some of these fires will burn all the way to October, and sometimes fires will burn through an entire season we call rekindle and even start the following year. So some of my largest fires have been out of uh, uh, Southern California, Central California in my career. What are some schools that you recommend to prepare for the field of firefighting? So it doesn't matter where you are, you guys can visit, take your parents, you can even 
Uh, if you have a fire station near you, go knock on the door and you can talk to the captain. You can talk to one of the firefighters and they'll help you. Some of these counties have um, explorer programs where you can start at a very young age that you can actually come in and start training um, if you're interested in the fire service and law enforcement as well. Uh, so that takes, again, your part. You have to go out and, and search for it. As I like to say, you got to knock on the door. If you don't knock on the door, no one's going to answer. So if you're interest, interested about the fire service or the law enforcement, reach out to your local fire station. That fire station is there for you. They work for us. You can go there and meet the captain, the firefighters, and they'll help you and instruct you if uh, they might have, again, an explorer program that you can start with them uh, and train and become a firefighter if you like. Mr. Ramos, we have another question. Did you fight a fire in the Cajon Pass? In the past, yes. That's um, the, what we call the I-5 corridor, Santa Ana corridors. Uh, I, again, I started my career here in Riverside County uh, with certain departments and then uh, started to work for the federal um, agencies. And uh, back in the 90s, I was on a helicopter. So when we got a call, we could go anywhere in Southern California or another state. So I've been all over from the San Bernardino National Forest to the Los Angeles National Forest. Um, and the list goes on and on, but we, I've spent a lot of time here <laughs> in this area um, on wildland fires in this area. Good question. We have another question. We have another question from Ukaipa. How did it feel to jump out of a plane the first time? And this is part of the training. So we didn't touch too bit on that. We could talk hours about smoke jumping training. So to become a smoke jumper, it's a process. You have to, again, remember, you have to knock on that door. We don't have a, um, a recruiting um, structure for smoke jumpers. You have to volunteer for it and, and want to become a smoke jumper. So that means you're doing your own training. And then once you get accepted, it's going to be anywhere from four to six weeks of what we call rookie training. That's kind of a boot camp. So in that four to six weeks, there was a lot of training involved. It dates back to 1939. Smoke jumpers have been here since 1939. We have ties back to World War II. And in that process, it's, it's been such what we call a recipe, a long recipe of training and how to perfect our training since 1939 to date. So when you're on your third, going in your third week, your fourth week of getting ready to start doing your live uh, uh, jumps out of a plane, it's already in you. There, there is no hesitation anymore. We are nervous, but once you're on that plane, that training kicks in. And when you're in the door and you start listening to the commands from your spotter, um, and this is where you can wash out. If you're too nervous, if you're not able to function, that's when you'll get pulled to the side. And you're not, you might not be a smoke jumper. It's not guaranteed. You have to pass the four to six weeks. So my first jump, I remember, Right, you're on the plane and you go through all the training over and over and over again for weeks, days on end, days on end of all the procedures you need to do. And I remember the dust when the jumpers were in front of me because I was uh, one of the last, we call it last of the boat. I was number eight on the plane. And as the jumpers are jumping out of the plane, you see all the dust and all the, and the, from the sunlight, you remember all of these small little details. And as you move up, you're getting closer to the door. Right. So, yes, you do get nervous a little bit and then the training kicks in because you don't want to fail. You want to make the program. You don't want to wash out. So once you get in the door and that spotter goes to his commands, they tap you on the leg and they tell you to get ready, the tap on the legs to exit the plane. And then all of a sudden your parachute opens and you're just I mean, the feeling is, you know, excitement but the training's still not over. That's your first jump. I got to do 15 of them, right? So you get down to the ground. It's only about a minute of flight time and you're, you're, you're bouncing off the wall. You're jumping for joy, but you're trying to be, you know, composed. Your trainers are watching you, right? So there's not a lot of high fives and in low, I like to do low fives. I'm a low five guy. And, and then, right. There's some, um, they're very stern. So there's no party and it's get back in the truck and do it again. We have to do 15 of those. And every time we jump out of the plane, we are graded every single time because if we do something wrong, we could hurt another jumper or even do something where 
um, the plane could have a serious issue and we could, uh, again, it's very serious. So we have to do 15 of those. And even once you're done with rookie training, the training still happens every year. We still have to do our physical tests. So great question. The feeling when I first jumped out of the plane was um, a sense of being proud and accomplishing something, but it was the start of another that kept going. So great question. Uh, but yes, everyone's a little bit nervous. Miss Noria's class asks, have you ever burned during a fire? Burned, I believe, is, is the question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, my, one of my first wildland fires here in Riverside County, uh, very young age, 17 years old, uh, again, brand new. And, you know, my mindset at the time was, you know, you're outside, you know, how, how can the fire be? And, you know, we train very aggressively. And I remember on that, one of my first fires, I got a little bit too close and um, some of my protective gear on my leg and I did uh, burn my foot a little bit. I did get a second degree burn on my foot. Uh, not bad, I kept doing my job, but it, you learn very quickly uh, uh, how to respect fire, it, it's no joke. So, and throughout my career, you get burned a lot, you get little burns. When we're on a big fire, there's little embers that'll come down, and they'll get stuck, stuck in your collar and you get so, you know, there's firefighters that have little scars and those are from little embers. And I remember one time, it was a funny quick story that I was on a fire. And it was uh, two jumpers. Uh, the first jumper, we always call the jumper in charge. Uh, I call him the woos. He was a very uh, funny guy, very strong, very energetic and one of my trainers. And uh, we had a very, a big fire that was uh, growing very largely, and very quick. We needed more smoke jumpers. And I remember I was trying to cut these limbs off the, the tree because as the fire climbs up it's like a ladder and it makes other trees catch on fire and I, I kept smelling like warm cookies being baked right and I'm like I said Louis I said, I'm smelling you cooking cookies and he said what are you talking about and one of the embers fell on my pack burned through my pack and landed on my chips ahoy <laughs> cookies so technically I did have warm cookies I finally figured it out I said, <laughs> as we took a break I had uh Kind of a burnt warm cookie so um yes you get little burns in the career of, of being a firefighter <laughs> and sometimes you get warm cookies okay coach harrison's class is asking what is the longest you have been on a fire the longest so Let's see, as a hell attack firefighter, that means um, I'm assigned to a helicopter. I'm either repelling out the helicopter or landing. So back in the early 90s, we were there for, I mean, it could go a month without even getting a day off. So uh, nowadays we work 21 days on and two days off. Back when I started, there was times where we go over a month being on a fire and then you might get a day off and then you come back on duty again. So it lasts all summer. You get kind of a day off, two days off, and you go back right back to the same fire again. So it just depends on what, if you're a hot shot, a smoke jumper. Um, what's nice about smoke jumpers, our, our skill set is to get the fires as fast as you can, put them out, and get back to the base and do it again. So we don't stay really too long on the fires because there's still less than 500 smoke jumpers in the United States. So you can imagine that all the lightning storms through the United States, one lightning storm can put down a thousand strikes, usually 10% of that could be fires. So when we get on fire, as soon as we're done, we call it rubber band. They want us back as fast as we can, get to the base, pack our parachutes. We call it rehab all our gear, clean our gear, put our gear back and get ready to go for the next fire. So Southern California, when I was here, had some of the longest fires, um, anywhere again from uh, New Mexico, Arizona, California, we're a national resource uh, as a hell attack crew. So we can fly anywhere, whoever requests us uh, from a local agency or whatnot. So yeah, great question. You guys are having awesome questions. Keep them coming. Our next question comes from Ms. Corey's class. How old do you have to be to start training to be a smoke jumper? Another amazing question. So the youngest you can be to apply to become a smoke jumper is 18. 
but we can't accept you yet because you have to have at least one year experience. So a season is six months. So basically two seasons, right, equates to two years. So that's the youngest you can come in. So 21, 22, you'd meet the requirements, but usually the smoke jumpers that are trying out for the program are highly experienced. So they're in their uh, mid twenties, late twenties. And sometimes we've had rookies uh, come in and pass the course at uh, over 50 years old, which is amazing because during that four to six weeks, you're doing a lot of running, you're doing a lot of push-ups, a lot of sit-ups, a lot of training. One of the tests uh, in smoke jumping in the first week, you have to do 110 pounds backpack, three miles, flat terrain, so level, under 90 minutes. And that test, what we call is an easy test. And you guys are probably going, easy, 110 pounds? Because when we're on a fire, we usually have more than 110 pounds on our back. And I believe there's some pictures there that you guys have. There's a pack there that I have 100, uh, just under 154 pounds that weigh more than me. And when you're on a fire, right, it's not flat terrain. We're going over rocks, streams. We're carrying our gear. So in training, they give you an easy test, 110 pounds, three miles and 90 minutes. And that's a pass or fail test. If you cannot pass that test, you don't become a smoke jumper. We can invite you back the next year, but you do not, there is no special treatment for anyone um, in the program in that four to six weeks. So you all have to perform the sit-ups, the push-ups, the running. So uh, the youngest, like I said, you could start uh, is in your mid twenties because you have to have experience. You have to be a wildland firefighter before you can apply to be a United States smoke jumper. Great question. Ms. Adams class asks, have you ever saved a life in a fire? I, well, you gotta remember, so being a firefighter, I've done both. I've done from structural firefighting to a wildland firefighter. So uh, when I started off at a very young, young age here in Riverside County, um, usually when people call 911, things are very bad, right? So there has been times in my career that we have saved folks. Yes, I've been on calls where we can get people out of car accidents, burning cars, homes, but there is a lot of sad stories uh, in my 30 years uh, that it's, you'll never forget them. So uh, I've saved animals, which is great, right? Because uh, especially as a smoke jumper, I work jump in the middle of nowhere. We've had uh, squirrels and snakes and uh, jumpers have saved coyote puppies and bears. Uh, Smoky Bear is a good example. Smoky Bear was saved by firefighters. So another great question, but being in the fire service, there is some sad days um, that sometimes we cannot uh, help folks. So we try our best all the time. But an amazing question. Ms. Fitzgerald's class asked, did you go to a fire academy? So when I started uh, back in here in 89, uh, our station had our own training. Uh, so you do all your training there with other new firefighters. Depends if they have enough firefighters, they might make a small academy. Um, in the smoke jumper realm as a wildland firefighter, that's again, rookie training. So that's that own segment, which is four to six weeks. Uh, to be a city firefighter now, there is a lot of academies that you can go out to. <clears throat> it depends on how long they last. But yes, depends on where you come from, what state, um, what department you might go to academy or you, you might not. So in my case, I kind of got a little bit of both, but I never went to an exactly academy because I was trained in our battalion in Riverside County. So again, I'm not, you guys have amazing questions. What is the altitude you jump from? Great question. So the what we call AGL, above ground level. We jump, uh, when I was on the round parachute, that was uh, 1,500 feet. The jumpers now, which are on the ram air parachutes, are jumping at 3,000 feet AGL. So we're not there to be um, a skydiver or a parachutist, right? We don't jump out at uh, 10,000, 12,000 feet and have a minute of free fall. We're there to get to as fa the fire as fast as we can. So there's not a lot of... Um, playing around or sightseeing when we jump out. Um, sometimes when jumpers jump 
out of a plane, we have things called thermal, right? You see uh, during the summertime, you have uh, clouds, uh, cumulus nimbus um, from the thermal heating. So you have updrafts, right? You ever seen feathers or um, things, uh, paper airplanes, or you guys see balloons, right? They go up really fast. So sometimes you jump out of a plane and guess what? We jump out at 1500 feet and now all of a sudden I'm higher than the plane. <laughs> right? That's happened to me a few times where I jump with my radio on and I've had the jump, the jump, we call the jump ship or the jump plane say, you know, they have to get out of my flight area now because I'm in a thermal and I'm higher now than the jump plane. And that's not fun because now my target that I was going to land in is changing, right? It's very dynamic. So now the jump spot that I was supposed to be at, I might have to pick an alternate. It might be a mile away a half a mile away, it might be over a cliff. This is where it gets very dicey. Um, there's a lot of talking to ourselves, <laughs> especially me. Um, you're talking to your parachute, you become very good friends with your parachute. And again, it's, it's very hard. So sometimes we jump out at 1500 feet of my career and also now I'm at almost 3000 feet. And we had one jumper, a friend of mine, uh, he was in the air for over five minutes and uh, he got so tired of holding his hands up that the jump plane, uh, he didn't have his radio on and they kept, they were trying to get contact with him because they didn't know if he got hurt because he brought his hands down. So now he can't steer his parachute, but his hands got so tired from holding them up with all the gear that we have. He could, so he was bringing them up, bringing them down, <laughs> bringing them up. So when he got down to, gr to the ground, he was, he was very happy because now he was a paraglider. He was gliding a thermal, which is not fun for smoke jumpers, <laughs> not at all. Have you ever had a halo jump? No, so smoke jumpers, high altitude, a low opening, that's what halo is. Um, we do have some, uh, which really cool. I got to work with um, three PJs, which are pararescue that do a lot of halo and high ho jumps. Um, there's a lot of different acronyms. So again, high altitude, low opening is uh, pararescues. They work <clears throat> for the Air Force. They're the combat, <clears throat> excuse me, medics. And they were also smoke chambers. So it's pretty cool to work with some of the best in the world, in the United States, to work with a pararescue. Uh, he was a smoke jumper, so he was a re reservist. Uh, but we don't do, so our stuff's very low jumping. Uh, again, we're at 1,500 feet or 3,000 feet which we call rough terrain. So remember there's mountains, rocks, uh, lakes. I've actually landed in the edge of a lake and my lake pockets and my smoke chipper gear, I had actually polywogs, baby frogs in my pocket and landing water is not fun. I actually bit the uh, side of my tongue off. Um, it didn't completely come off, but it was enough where I couldn't talk very well because of how I bit my, so I jumped for a little bit with the mouth guard because sometimes you hit the ground very hard and um, things happen. Great question, great question, great question. Where was the most chaotic fire you jumped into? Ooh, probably the one, if you, if you go on Google and watch my TEDx talk, the opening to that is a fire that we jumped out. We called it, it was a, a four manner. So four smoke jumpers. We have ladies as well, we call them a four manner. Um, <clears throat> we had four smoke jumpers there. At, on that fire, I was doing the recon, so I'm doing the light, line placement. I'm out in front of the other jumpers. And uh, that fire, with taking all the weather, all the technology we have, I was taking the weather, that fire was getting very big. And I knew at that point, I was talking to the jumper in charge, which we call the JIC. And I was telling him, hey, uh, this fire is probably going to burn to October. I don't think we're going to catch it. We're getting spot fires, meaning other fires a quarter mile away, a mile away. Because remember, these fires can also make their own weather, and they also can make their own lightning and rain and hail off from its own fire. So I remember getting up to a fire, and I knew it was getting very big. And that part that you see on Google, my TEDx, is me um, getting what we call pushed out of the fire and uh, a very dicey uh, part of that fire. You can hear my, my breathing. I was very tired. And um, I'm here today, right? I'm, I'm glad I was not hurt on that fire. But I remember calling the jumper in charge at that point after that, that video clip. And I asked him, he said, you know, I said, Bill, the jumper's last name, I call him by the last name. 
Ramos and he answered and I said, uh, I get to a high point. And he says, you know, what do you got? I said, just find a high point. I mean, I want him to climb somewhere high so he can see. I gave him a compass bearing. So he gets to look in the area that I want him to look. And I said, do you see that call and that fire? He says, yeah. I said, that's our fire. He says, are you sure? <laughs> I said, yes, that's our fire. He says, oh, it's pretty big. I said, yes, sir. So we had to actually get out of there, go to our safety zone and uh, mother nature put that fire out. So um, yeah, interesting times as, as smoke jumpers. Great question, great question. Yes, awesome. Have you ever collided with anyone? Yes. <laughs> And it's not fun. I'm, I'm laughing here, right? It's um, it's something that we train a lot. Uh, sometimes we jump, we get very close proximity. Sometimes your jump partner, someone that you really know, or it might be another jumper from another state. That's what's interesting about smoke jumpers. We could be at a base that had a bunch of lightning fire. We could have, uh, we have a total of nine bases in the United States. So you can have jumpers from all over at one smoke jumper base and you might know that other jumper or they might be a rookie so you don't know their capabilities right they're new so when you jump out of a plane there's a lot of communication that we're talking it's very quiet there's nothing um, to block our sound right we're in the air so we get to talk and hear that other jumper and it's very again close proximity as we're flying into a very tight spot between trees and, and rocks and whatnot so uh, there was times in training that I've had where you bump into another parachute. Again, it's something that we do not want to do. And you train on that concy if you make a mistake and you, you dissect that. Every time we jump, then we're graded and they're called after action reviews. So we have to look at ourselves every time we're filmed, usually three times. Um, there's a camera on the plane. There's usually uh, sometimes two cameras on the plane. And there might be two or, or three or cameras on the ground. So they're filming everything we do. And once we're jumping, once we're done, or after action review, every jumper has to give a brief of their jump sequence. So from the door, jumping out of the plane, from the parachute manipulation, the parachute open up if they had a malfunction, um, uh, their path to the jump spot, their landing, and they have to explain it to everyone and sometimes you might say, yeah, I jumped out, had a clean opening. Um, I turned right two times or I pulled left a quarter breaks. And the trainer says, no, you did not, Mr. Ramos. You actually did two left turns. So you learned the process, how to give a, a, a briefing. Um, and that is, again, something that a smoke jumper has to do. If you're not able to do that in training, if you're not able to remember what you're doing or to stay calm, um, you might not make the program. So, and it doesn't matter if you're the commanding officer of the base with 25 years experience, they are still graded every time they jump out of the plane. Great question. We have time for one more question, but I'd like to ask you first to share the name of the book you wrote and your passion for writing the book. Great question. So, uh, the book is it's called Smoke Jumper by Jason Ramos. My co-author was Julian Smith, and I've been very lucky, right? I, I've been I've had some great mentors uh, from my high school all the way up to a very young age. My my dad, uh, my family, and I got offered. I remember a uh, quick story. I got a phone call. Went to my voicemail at work, and one of the largest publishing agencies in, in the world, Harper Collins, called me, what we call cold call, and offered me a book deal. That I didn't even understand that. It's like, usually to write a book, you write a book, you go look for a publisher. <clears throat> if you're lucky, they publish your book. So I got a, a, a book deal from um, the publisher because they did some research on smoke drums. They found me, they liked me, and it, it's an opportunity. So the passion, I actually told them no. Right. <clears throat> and some of my friends and advisors, what do you mean? No, this is huge. So some of my mentors, they, they brought me down, back down to ground level and said, Jason, this is a great opportunity. You get to tell your story. So the passion, I get to put my passion into my book and inspire. And I've had um, firefighters now that have read my book 
and they're firefighters now, and some of them are jumpers. They, they've made the path. Uh, they call me, I, I, I consult them over the phone, I become their mentor, and I'm still friends with some of them today that have read my book and have their own career, not only firefighting, uh, some have become law enforcement, some have went into the military, some have went into other parts of public service. So um, you can find my book on Amazon, just Google Jason Ramos Smoke Jumper, and you could, um, it's on Audible, or you could uh, find it in your local bookstore. And here's our last question. Did you help out during 9-11? So we had jumpers that did go to 9-11. Um, I was not one of them. Um, we were doing our work still here. We still were in fire season when that happened. I still remember that day. Uh, I remember where I was at. And we did have two jumpers in New York at the time doing some other work. Uh, so they, they got to experience some very bad things. Uh, a lot of the jumpers at that time, uh, remember some of the PJs we talked about their prayer rescue. We had reservist Air Force, some other base had Marines, some went into the service. Um, so we were still in very high fire threat during 9-11. And we had um, some very interesting briefings, right? At that point, the United States was basically in lockdown. So as smoke jumpers, we were uh, kind of that, that front line uh, back in World War II. Um, we had early forms of terrorism of, of the Japanese sending hot air balloons over uh, to the United States and starting forest fires. So we got briefed at that time of 9-11. We, we didn't, no one knew what was happening right at that point. So as smoke jumpers, we were ready to go still, um, but we did have some smoke jumpers in uh, New York that were helping as much as they could. They were only two folks. And then we had some folks that actually went back there which we call under the incident command system, the ICS system, which is shared through the, the whole United States. So any hurricanes, floods, 9-11 is all under the incident command system. So we did um, have a lot of firefighters uh, respond to New York and help out. So a very sad day. Well, we have come to the end of our session today. Um, we trust that you enjoyed uh, spending time with Jason Ramos. We thank Jason for um, being with us today and sharing what it is like to be an aerial delivered firefighter. And so I want to make sure and invite all the educators out there from the Inland Empire to continue to help us build the school to career pipeline. Go to sbcalliance.org and look for the next SB Connect session coming this week. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.